Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. Today we are extremely lucky to be joined by Dr. David Woods. David, if you could be kind enough to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Um, yeah, thank you. You're not allowed to check your notes. Though. John. Absolutely not. <laughs> Jack. Well, look, it, it's so confusing what I do these days. People, you know, kind of go into a swirl when I start talking about it. So, well, what do you think you do? Well, I know what I earn a living doing, which is uh, making theatre. That's my main kind of activity. When you say making theatre, are you a yeah. carpenter? Well, it, yeah, again, you see the confusion just swirls. But um, sometimes, yeah, I am a carpenter. I'm a van driver. I'm a bolt fixer. I'm a light focuser. I'm a sound designer. Um, I'm an editor. But if you were to go to the traditional roles, um, it is I write plays. They get published eventually. Um, I direct the play, and I also act in the play. So you are from go to woe, the whole very thing. heavily involved yeah. in the production, particularly yeah. of theatre. Yeah, I'm, and then I'll externally to that, that, so that's really what I do as my own company, Ridiculous Must, which has been going for 34 years as a double act. Where did the name come from? Uh, it comes from Horace's epistle, Paturient Montes Nascito Ridiculous Must, which means mountains heave in childbirth and a ridiculous mouse is born. Um, yeah, there you go. Well, you asked. So, yeah, it means, um, you know, big things can be expressed in light ways, yeah. um, which is, is come as a sort of bit of a motto for that work that I do with Jonathan Haynes, Dr. Jonathan Haynes. Um, we say doctor, what are, you, what are you a doctor of? So both John and I, we were feeling after about 16 years of practice that um, we weren't sort of in the literature. The, the, the body of work was just being eaten and forgotten. Um, and so we both signed up for firstly masters at University of Kent when this wave of practice-based research was um, emerging in the in the sector, and um, enjoyed it so much we continued on to do PhDs. And, and what, um, what specifically was your PhD on? So my thesis was called "How to Be Funny." I feel like it's a very very clever topic. Can you can you explain what what you found, and well, can you explain a little bit about what it does take to be funny? And the other thing, actually, too, I think of when I think of theatre, I don't think of research. I think of yeah. you know that purely related to the arts and creativity, which is not necessarily something that mm. you intellectualise. But it's interesting to consider that yeah. in that particular field, because I think of within our field, we obviously are always considering research and how it influences what yeah. we do. I feel like in the arts, that's almost the opposite, but I guess you've looked at trying to merge those two worlds. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I have almost sort of physically merged those two worlds now that I've gone into psychology as well. Um, we'll get to that. Yeah, but we'll You're get to that. <laughs> but to, to say, I don't know where to take this one first, but, well, what's, what's um, how to be funny? Do you want mm. to know that one yeah. quickly? Well, we can just, yeah riff that off or you can watch my sermon online um which I where did we find that actually you did mention that uh, the school of life melbourne um did a series of um secular sermons and uh, so i was commissioned to do one on humor uh john saffron's in there as well doing some voodoo thing on the rooftop at what happened to that bloke uh, I think he's still doing voodoo things on rooftops at dawn. <laughs> really I feel like sure. he's disappeared off the face of the yeah. earth. I don't kind of follow him. So, um, but it was great to have that opportunity to sort of just take the the research and the academic work into a sort of more you know accessible, plain language form. Um, but yeah, essentially that that was about looking at humor theory and how whether you can sort of just learn the theories and then apply them in practice, the theories being, uh, or the groups of theories being that humour is all about uh, superiority, coming from Plato and so on. The second group being about humour being about incongruity, which is Schopenhauer, Kant, people like that. And uh, the third group well, being really driven by um, Freud's sense of humour being a release, a relief about taboo subjects. We just talk about something taboo. Um, and people will laugh. And, and really, I, I sort of say quite early on that this is not a study of laughter, but that is your measurement of whether something's comedy well, or not. We, we spoke about this the other day. So you mentioned that clearly things like superiority are not well 
uh, mm. accepted these days as a form of comedy, you know, putting other people down mm. or showing that, for instance, you know, one group is superior to another. Mm. But you mentioned in that discussion that exact point that you made, that comedy, really, the only way to assess its value is based on whether somebody laughs. Mm-hmm. How do you think, because that to me is an incongruence. Mm. Because it does it doesn't matter what is said if someone or a group of people find it funny, <laughs> you, and well, you're allowed to get yourself in trouble here because we, <laughs> we don't have that many listeners, so you'll be all right. I, I think it's about finding your audience. So you know, if you can, yes, find a safe place to do your kind of humour and people are laughing at it, and you've, in, the, I mean, the other part of that equation is that you intend the laugh to come. You know, if you if people are laughing at you without intending that to be it's not really the same kind of impulse as somebody wanting to learn how to make comedy but in in some situations and arguably my own um and definitely my double act partners we found people were laughing at what we were doing when we were trying to be serious so we just <laughs> okay. thought well, okay well let's just let's just be serious and get laughs you know and call it comedy um is that an interesting experience in the sense that you don't have control over what people necessarily find funny. And so you put together an act and you think, oh, this will be good, this will be good. And then you, you demonstrate and no one laughs at those, mm. but they laugh at you just standing there. Yeah. And you think, okay, I need to amplify the volume on me standing here like a goofball. Yeah, exactly. Even though I'm not yeah. doing anything, people find that so funny. Is that a weird experience to say, oh, I really didn't expect that outcome? Um, it's a joyous experience. Yes, so oh, it, not, it, it's a positive. If but... that's where your search is, obviously, as you, if you're trying to make a serious production of Macbeth, which I'm about to do next month at the Malt House, is that a shameless plug? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's massive poster on there. There is just on our street on Hoddle Street here. Um, so there you go. There's one. There go, go and see. Go and see David. In, uh, but in it's meant Macbeth. to be serious, and I'm thinking, where's the humor? You know, and it's. Are you going to try and just <laughs> well, take over the show? I really don't. I'm a bit nervous about what will happen because you know I arrive on stage and I've just got this kind of presence that may, you know, that might provoke laughter, and I'm thinking, okay, how are we going? How are we going to arrange? What did your in? presence <laughs> provoke laughter? Well, I don't know, but um, <laughs> people find you funny in people, general. Yeah, there's something about that that kind of. I mean, if we really nut down to what my take on it is, so, you know, having looked at all those theories and then sort of uh, made a piece of practical research work called How to Be Funny as well, um, yeah, I sort of boiled it down to this um, feeling of having an aspiration uh, or, or, you know, a, 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 trying to do something sort of the, which is beyond your capacity, failing. Um, but they're not indulging in the failure, but sort of struggling on the rebound to get out of the failure. And I think there's a lot of art now which sort of indulges in the failure, and it's not funny at all. It's sort of, you know, smug. Can right. you can you give an example of that? <laughs> no, I'm not defaming anybody on no, the show. No, no, you don't have to say names. You can um, change things. You're clever enough. To do well, that. What, what, what kind of example? They, they, I'm, I'm not smart enough to work yeah. out what analogy you use. I will there. call it, uh, yeah, and, and please do. Pull me up if there's any kind of technical terms that, um, you know. Uh, you know uh, us, of course we will. Just, just keep <laughs> so, going, mate. Okay, post-traumatic. There, there's a wave of work which sort of felt um, that acting was a bit embarrassing. How embarrassing trying to be something that's not yourself. Just be yourself. Um, and so they, it came with this sort of deadpan, ironic vibe. I, I called it Shoreditch because it sort of, that suburb seemed to, Capture that spirit to me. This sort of. Oh, I have a theory on this as well. Like, I actually want your opinion on this, and this will probably get you and probably not me in trouble, but you at least, which is enjoyable for me. <laughs> I don't think Joaquin Phoenix acts. I think he's just a depressive loser. <laughs> any, any thoughts on that? Um, well, is he the, in that style that you're talking about? No, he's not at all. Okay. No, this is really in the live sector where the crossover between performance art and okay. theatre uh, exists. Um, I actually think he's quite amazing that that rap artist that he sort of went so deeply into rap. That was fake, wasn't it? Well, exactly. I'm sure it was fake, but he just went so deeply and he was so committed to it. You you had to kind of go along with this uh, kind of... My my theory on these last few movies is that he doesn't play anyone other than himself and he keeps getting awards for it. I think he's just a depressive megalomaniac. (laughs) That's just who he is. Well, you know, you could say that a lot about acting. Uh, and, and that may be partly that kind of kickback against 
what I said the criticism of post-traumatic theatre was that it was just a bit embarrassing to pretend. So you just really work on aspects of yourself that, that are then enhanced or you say these particular words or, you know, you dance in front of the mirror in the case of the Batman, um, the Joker mm. when he played that. Um, but those are, you know, creative expressions. He's not doing that every morning breakfast and he's certainly not looking gaunt like he was. How do you know? Well, because then, you know, three weeks later on the red carpet, he's looking plump and healthy again. Um, where you kind of imagine, okay, so this is the real Dragon Phoenix, you know. Or, um, But again, you know, if you look at the work of Goffman and so on, you, you see that, you know, everything we do, what we're doing right now is a kind of performance, you know. So we, we, have a, we perform an everyday self. Yeah. It, it steals us against, you know, criticism in problematic areas gives us that kind of boundary and we'll come back to that point when we talk mm. about my coaching later <laughs> well i think we can talk about it in relation to psychology because yeah, yeah. that starts to, straight away the people yeah. who don't know david's now gone into studying psychology and i know that you're not necessarily using it for your theater work and and, and your productions mm. but i assume that there's crossover yeah. um can you talk to and maybe elaborate on whether you think that there are certain personality traits or things that you're learning in that field that you think actually lend itself not only to what you just mentioned, that ability to move and morph almost like a chameleon through different personas, but also, you know, potentially that allows people to be a bit more creative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I came to psychology really after working in psychology for a lot of uh, a, a large body of work which was sponsored by the Wellcome Trust which is a pharmaceutical company that now commissions artwork and research in England um, so the, <laughs> there's a bit of an ethical dilemma about it <laughs> yeah. that's an interesting combination yeah, yeah but they um, you know they've supported us very well for a block of about five years um, and we made a series of pieces about contemporary mental health issues starting with psychosis and then evolving into a new a sort of invented mental illness called um complicated grief which was proposed for inclusion in the next issue of the the diagnostic statistical manual for psychiatric disorders dsm5 um yeah suggested that so i was doing this body of work and we had collaborators Wait, sorry it's the stop, yeah, stop sorry. one second yeah. so you your creative work started to lend itself actually into mm. a research arm of psychology. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. What yeah. Why? Do, you, do you think that that naturally happened or do you think, and, and it, is it yeah. an expression of, I always think about this and this is like, I was probably the most critical person of artistic kind of endeavors mm. as a younger person because I was really stupid and arrogant. But now the time goes on, I see more than anything, and I think this is a, a Dostoevsky thing, like humans don't really live other than to often please our own aesthetic, mm. right? And it's these aesthetic pursuits that drive so much of our behavior. Yeah. And art, to me, has become something that, and it's all forms, obviously, and people are attracted to different forms, but it evokes the opportunity to explore emotional realms that you may not actually necessarily explore and the thing that i always find really interesting and i don't know whether you can articulate this much better than i am doing but the complexity of emotional experience that you can have viewing even something that's like a painting is so vast it seems to defy the logic of the fact that it's one observation of something over a very short period of time and it's one image um it, I don't know. I don't know. I'm rambling, but does that does that seem? Uh, no, I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I find the the most enriching artistic consumption that I have is in pretty minimal. Yeah, uh, pro with minimal provocation. So I particularly enjoy watching dance and dance theatre, even though I don't do that. Um, uh, but I find that the, there's this sort of space for me to meet the work. And I think with two-dimensional work and, and sculptures and so on, um, you sort of, there, there is always that space because you're in this kind of blank whiteness and you're kind of told to drop the world behind and just meet the work. And that's a wonderful sort of happening. Do, I know we're getting away from the question that I asked originally, but do, okay. do you, 
Do you think that we actually understand as a society the value of this? Because, as I said, as a younger, dumber person, I'm not going to even pretend that's not true, I didn't see the value until I started to experience that. And it's so enriching. But I feel like particularly in uh, the world we live in, that is everything's so practical and efficient, we seem to miss this idea of what these experiences do for enhancing our human experience generally. I'm looking at Jack. Are you feeling left out? Are you okay? No, Jack, 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 <laughs> used to Jack probably consumes <laughs> this stuff more than I do because yeah. he actually has, yeah. particularly through his brother, he has a quite, yes, a, a quite, musician yeah, like, quite an yeah. involvement in music. Yeah. and. Yeah. His brother has actually been a big influence on me to explore much more music yeah. because I, you know, I don't listen to music much at all. Yeah. Um, but his his brother, particularly Thomas, has actually been quite a big influence on me exploring older stuff and things that are much more classical, for instance. And it seems to me that if you look at our society, particularly in somewhere like Australia, that it, it's become hyper practical, but. And our investment, it seems like in things like the arts is going down, like most areas. Um, we're losing out because of that. I think often, you know, the arguments from the sector when faced with funding cuts are to go to those formative experiences and you say, well, you know, what, what, um, what, what was it what, that awakened you as a human being? Um, and, you know, that might have, a formative experience might have been in COVID, for example, where people were consuming lots and lots of artistic um, expression, you know, the, in the form of movies and yeah. radio, music, whatever. Well, there's, um, there's another good question for you coming, but keep going. Yeah, so they, you kind of go, well, this, you know, in, in times of break, you know, you have a relationship breakup or something. The first thing you do is want to find some music that yeah. speaks to that. that that's, breakup music. Everyone's yeah, got, everyone's got that, play, that playlist mix. <laughs> You know, the get-together mix, the, the difficult sort of second wave mix. It's so know? funny how um, it's, it's, it um, sounds like a bit of a trope. But you watch movies and it's almost you can do the whole arc through a couple of songs. Yeah. I, I, the thing I think about straight away with music, though, too, is how people use it a lot now to regulate their emotions. Yes. Because it does invoke emotions as well, which sometimes is to reinforce an emotional state you're already in or maybe to try and shift your emotional state to something else that you want because you're about to do a gym session, you want to get pumped exactly. up. Or... Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, yeah, exactly. Last night I was sort of on the way to coaching and I was feeling a bit kind of fatigued, let's say, <laughs> you know, kind of needed to go into role. And, yeah, I, I needed to find the music that would get me from fatigue to, you know, coach persona and yeah motivated to uh, actually yeah. carry out that role yeah. and, and sometimes it's too brutal to just go right 160 beat per minute what's the mixtape and because it's already there you know i need something that's going to get me there um so in the case of uh, last night it was this superb album by a band called gallo street um that uh, was a response to different landscapes in in the netherlands um <laughs> And the, the album starts very sparse, um, but, you know, in the sort of 20-minute journey from my place to Coburg, it got to, you know, the coast, mm. let's say, and, and I was sort of ready then to deal with my... It, it's interesting you say that you know, because I feel like it's something that the best albums, and it, people don't, younger people these days, I don't necessarily even understand the idea of an album having a performance sequence mm. because... They don't consume it in that way, which is it's a bit of a shame. It's about hits now. Yeah. yeah, it's a bit of a shame. And I do think that some artists still definitely do it. But yeah. for instance, I, I remember as a complete album, um, it was the first time in my life that I think I really understood it as a complete album. Was I don't know if you know the British band Alt-J. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. When they brought out uh, their first major album, I remember listening to it on one continuous drive. I was, it was on the radio and they played the whole thing. And I just thought, actually, that's one piece that all fits together perfectly. And they had all these, interestingly, it, it's clearly made like that. Cause it's got, they have all these like interludes that actually sit between yeah, yeah. sort of parts Hidden of tracks and that. Kind yeah. Of but it was really interesting because it was one of the first times that I recognized as an adult, like, oh, actually, artists are actually thinking about how they construct that. And it's exactly what you're saying. It took you to a certain place and mm. 
you often know where you want to get to, yeah. or at least in a headspace by that time. Yeah, I kind of go have to. I'm going to go to track three to six. That's no, no, be. that's funny you say <laughs> that. <laughs> but I think there's actually. I, I wonder if there's a correlation between the phenomenon we see now, where people don't listen to an album. Obviously, not that long ago, if you wanted to listen to music, it would only be a live performance, or yes. then it'd be a record because and you couldn't really control changing songs. Yeah, it was a bit hard. Where yeah. nowadays we obviously have Spotify, which allows you to listen to literally every song, any song in the world here and now. And I do wonder how that influences uh, the art because it seems that people's attention spans are waning and people's commitment to go, I'm going to go watch this city production, go out, get to a particular venue at a certain time, spend one, two, three hours watching this performance and then go mm-hmm. home. That seems to also be waning as well. And I, I want to ask this question to you because do you think that a lot of the expression of art now is through more memetics? Like I think about mm. social media mm. and, and meme culture, mm. which it seems to be invading every element of society. Mm. That seems to be much more of an expression of, of art. And I think that also aligns with people's attention span because mm. so many memetics now are two, three seconds. Mm. It seems that. Uh, that has a big influence on on the shift of the of the arts scene yeah. because people's attention spans are becoming much less. I, I think there's a lot of anxiety because of the lack of resources, mm. and that leads you to this kind of focus on the mimetic aspect. Yeah, mimesis has always been a core part of art making, and you know, when, one of the pre questions about creativity. We, you know that that is an absolute cornerstone for me mm. that you say okay everything's been done before pretty mm. much so let's let's embrace that uh let's copy the masters uh and because inevitably in the copying it, certainly in the performing arts it's kind of just the process of going through your body and your mind will end up with a very different piece of work um so you do that as a kind of training exercise you do that as research and then eventually you sort of drop all the source moments and then you end up with your unique product. And this came up in your chat with Massimo, which was quite interesting. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there he was talking about establishing an aesthetic, establishing a brand and so on. And, and I think, you know, there, there are comfort spots in the aesthetic. If you think about where did my aesthetic come from? And it's often from your sweet spots in yes. your life, your upbringing. You, you know, that time that you were happy in this place and th- with this person and so on. And so you go back to those moments and you want to try and recreate them. And so, yeah, in this high, high speed culture we're in, we, we go to that thing that was last on our, the top of our feed because it was made us laugh or it made us smile or whatever. So you go, yeah, that's that. But it's a very shallow experience. Yes, absolutely. And, and, you know, yes, I am on one hand sort of thinking about a 20 minute play festival in order to make it commercially viable. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Lure an audience. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I want to do that deep thinking work that Mm. goes into what this kind of more soulful, reflective meaning making area. So, you know, like if you think about comedy, you can go through those theories that I was talking about and functionally produce laughter but you will completely forget it afterwards like you know we were trying to remember mm. we were trying to remember a jimmy Carr joke but yes. it's just like it's gone because <laughs> in the moment it's funny but mm. really it's not that deep or not interesting and maybe there's a meme of it but you just kind of go i don't know it just diverted me temporarily if you really want to get into people's hearts and minds and get those formative experiences that we're talking about that make that justify art then you have to do this work that goes way beyond well, function. Can, can we get onto that? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I think, no, no, yeah. I, I, it leads perfectly into this. Yeah. The thing that I find really interesting, and, and I, I, like, we'll get onto the coaching because I, for people who don't know, you also coach track oh, and field, yeah. and you're a track and field athlete yourself, still competing in, in master's competition. Um, but one of the experiences that I have often is, I'm a big consumer of, I particularly like movies, right? And I like exploring movies that have interesting concepts, interesting ideas. And I, I, I wouldn't mind actually getting your opinion on this, but even uh, recently I went to Japan with one of my athletes and on the plane, I saw that there was a newish movie from uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, I think his name is the director. 
and it was it's called Poor Things. I think mm. the name of this. Yeah. With uh, Emma Stone. Yeah, I know it, but I haven't seen it. Anyway, but he he's I find him a really interesting director because he does these movies that really push the boundaries. I don't know if you have you seen the movie Killing of a Sacred Deer. I have. Yeah. 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 And this is the director and also the lobster. Have you seen the lobster? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have seen it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> these are on Colin, what's his name? Colin Farrell. Oh, Farrell, sorry. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, yeah. yeah. He's in, in both, both of them, them actually. Yeah. Um, no, it sounds like the kind of thing I would like. You would love this. Yeah, you yeah. would love this director. He's a fantastic yeah. director. But he chooses yeah. these stories and some of them are Greek tragedies and these ideas. Mm-hmm. And I try and push some of these younger athletes that I coach, like, watch these movies. And they, they watch them and they go, fuck, you're weird. Mm-hmm. Like, why would you watch the yeah. stupidest film? It's so <laughs> weird. All this... And I say to them, they're like, do yeah. you like that? And, and it's not that I, I, the experience that you have with this is not mm-hmm. about necessarily finding it pleasurable on a surface level. It's about you exploring the idea yeah. and having an emotional experience that takes you away from your day-to-day functioning. And that to me is what really good art does. And that's mm. exactly what I feel like you were saying. If you need to go deeper, you need to try and give people the opportunity to explore an idea mm. at some level of depth that they maybe have an experience. And, what- and Well, I was going to say, just to actually reinforce that, John, it's actually more valuable when you have that experience and you go, that was just so bizarre yeah. or so outside of my my, con- my concept of how yeah. I sort of see reality that it's probably the most useful because you get the biggest shift to go, well, hang on a second. I've never actually considered looking at yeah. something. Yeah, and what would, what would I do in that situation? Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, what is, what is my conception of this situation? It's really interesting and I – I, I try and push them to watch these things, not because I think that they necessarily will enjoy it, but actually to push their ability to deal with both the psychological and emotional aspects of asking themselves those questions mm. of like, what would I do in this situation? Mm. Um, and I think that that to me is a really important function of art. But as Jack said, people's um, attention span is low and also people's willingness to put themselves in uncomfortable emotional situations mm. seems to be diminishing because I think for a reason, and, and I'm guessing here, but yeah. I think for the reason that our world is more and more uncertain. So people don't want to even then consume entertainment that pushes that. Mm. But I actually think it's helpful because it expands your envelope of yeah. resilience in some Absolutely. aspects. Which is transferable totally to the coaching. Work. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if you, if you come back to, you know, you ask, or about personality types, who who's kind of more creative, or let's say more, um, you know, willing to experience a, a film, even mm. that's sort of outside of the Marvel yeah. universe. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we, we can get onto Martin Scorsese's, yeah. you know, questioning um, of the Marvel being cinema. Yeah. <laughs> what you know, one of like as I said, I, I kind of psychology for me is more about articulating what I kind of felt I had a handle on anyway through exploring characters and stories and so on. And, um, you know, one of those articulations is this idea of the five big personality types. Yes, so, yeah. um, you know, we, we have, we're probably all on a spectrum for all of them, but we have different sort of emphases. So openness to experience. Yeah, it seems one to be the one. Talking about. Yeah. But at the same time, um, you know, you kind of, if you, if you translate that into actual creativity, you also need, a bit of extroversion in order to yes. express that kind of interest, that curiosity. And maybe if it wants to be on social justice themes, you also have to have aspects of the personality trait of conscientiousness. Yes. And if you want to persuade other people to come in with you and do this, you have to have a, a fairly strong score on the agreeableness trait. And then I was thinking, well, that leaves just neuroticism then. There's yeah. the only one left. And in a way, you kind of go, well, I can't, I can't not express this idea and mm. you start worrying about this problem and then you that want motivates to you to do it yeah so really you sort of got all of them firing but really for me the kind of that initial uh, impulse is openness to experience the curiosity so it's why you read medical papers why you go to italy to do your studies why you you know you try you try a different training protocol or whatever mm. um and you're hoping that the, your the, your athletes will come with you you know, so the the question is, can you create that culture that brings, or in my case, an audience to try this different experience? You know, 
will you try running backwards up a hill <laughs> with a weighted vest on? Um, you know, those kind of things. How can you, how can you be, use your agreeableness to win them, to get by in, uh, as Brett Bartholomew calls it in conscious coaching? Um, so, you know, we, 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 we have different impulses, but yes, society at a particular time can influence that. So we're feeling like we're overwhelmed with the world. So we're probably less inclined to be curious because we're scared. Mm. And fear is such a powerful driving force. In it's all such an inhibitor, isn't it? Yeah, and that fear can be, you know, your ego being damaged by not winning that race. And that's often a problem that I find with my young athletes is that they've come through their school, their little region, and they've won and won and won and won and won. And suddenly, you know, they've gone to district or region and been hammered. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And suddenly it's all over for them. Then there might be one chance where you go, okay, let's rebuild. And we've got to accept that losing is going to be the experience you get most of the time. Well, not winning, let's say. You yeah. know, you, you're going to... If you really think about it, it's yeah. the most probable outcome. Yeah, yeah, you're going to lose. You're going to get injured. The, these things are going to happen. But, you know, believe me, <laughs> and this is where the trust thing comes yeah. in, that you've got to win that trust to say, look, I've seen it or I've actually done it myself. I've experienced this, yeah. And this is the kind of trajectory that happened. But there's this little golden path, you know, that could lead to amazing glory if we navigate and approach this with a spirit of humility and curiosity. We can get there. We can trick our way through. I'm, love I'm loving the way that you're describing this. Is, is this something that you think lends well from your performative experiences to your coaching because yeah. there is a performative aspect I think to coaching and as you said it's about balancing those tensions between bringing someone along for this ride and getting them to trust you and making sure that they they stay open to the experience and wanting to explore mm. and that has a, an element of danger in it yeah. is, is this something that you you found helpful in your ability especially with yeah. younger athletes to yeah. take them on that journey yeah um you know i i got into coaching just as a kind of covid side gig um you know my own children were idling and i started saying well why don't we get your friends would do a socially distanced um exercise session you go over there yeah, yeah. Right. and look you you five or whatever the number was at the time are over there you but you happen to be doing the same thing as we're doing and you're doing that because you can see us doing it it's <laughs> nothing illegal we're getting that. around the rules with you david <laughs> absolutely you know just because i could see their lives deteriorating mm. you know, oh just yeah going down you don't need to justify to us no so and then you know that kind of migrated into uh offering squad training for juniors at Coburg, mm. and um i i sort of quickly saw that you know the what the, the patterns were that little ass was bustling with these sort of driven parents going come on pb this week pb you're gonna go to regions we got states <laughs> yeah, that's right you're gonna be world champion at uh, seven <laughs> yeah and then girls especially complete disappearance you know from sort of 13 to mm. beyond you yeah. know and if you were lucky there was somebody who'd got nationals and kind of was getting enough affirmation for that would get them through that all quicker I, I always have this discussion yeah. with people and no one's willing to have everyone thinks that it's some rubbish about like I don't even know what they think it is. I think the main reason, male, female, that people drop out of athletics is because they realize they're no good, <laughs> right? And that's a horrible experience for most people, especially around yeah. twelve or thirteen. Yeah. It's the first time you have almost, you know, that a level of awareness to go, oh, yeah. I'm actually no good at this. I, it's <laughs> also very in your face compared to say a team sport where you, well, can, you can hide, hide behind other. Oh, we won! Good we, you know, exactly. we won the footy game, and it's like, yeah, but you did nothing. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, you played centre half bench for the whole game. Yeah. As opposed to athletes, where it's like, oh wow, I lost that race by thirty meters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's very exposing. Athletics. Yeah, but you know, I I have to say, no good. You know, you're let's say you're saying from their point of view, it's like. You know, this person can run 10 2. I can only do 11 5. Yeah. Uh, therefore, I'm no good. 11 5 is excellent. You know, like, well, yeah. it, <laughs> maybe not in your book. But no, 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 no. Relative to what, I guess. Yeah. No, no, yeah. but it's, it's not, it's not yeah. about the performance. And as I said, like, I think this is the big thing that we don't have discussions mm -hmm. on because it seems to even affect people's ability in a workplace. People can't seem to separate. And I think this is actually a major, I don't know where this came from. 
you may know because of your psychology studies, this tying of people's worth to the activities that they do, you know, like they, they seem it's either career or sport. They create this identity of like, that's who I am. And it's like, no, 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 that's what you do. Who you are is the underlying, you know, structures of your personality, your values, all of those things. And you demonstrate that through the activities that you do. But they get it wrong when you say, oh, that performance wasn't very good. And they, they take that as a personal criticism. It's like, no, no, I'm criticizing your performance, yeah. right? If I said that you have no ability to get better, that's a very different thing because then I'm criticizing your capabilities and your skill set, which is actually make up of who you are as a person. But the other thing I think of though, John, is talking about as a coach challenging athletes' perceptions through you know, even, say, watching a movie of – the discomfort that pushes them that pushes them into within a, a facet of their life that they don't feel confident or comfortable with. Because I think of a good athlete is probably very happy to take on criticism and feedback about this is what you need to do the next. Don't but, even they don't even register it in any negative way. They just see it as an opportunity to work on whatever's next. But then they may not see that opportunity in terms of developing certain psychological attributes, even though part of this journey is to go you actually need to develop these traits or have a, a, a more openness to actually see the change you want in your performance well, that's a good question i think for you dave is one of the biggest challenges that i've had and i'd love your opinion on this with coaching is it doesn't seem to be any issue with as jack just mentioned pushing people physically people will in, enjoy the idea of punishing themselves physically they like doing hard sessions as you know especially in the 400, 800, mm. lactic, and oh, I trained really hard and I'm really tired, oh, I'm sweating and I'm on the ground, I vomited. <laughs> and there's, no, I'm serious. And yeah. as you know, there's almost a, a badge of merit for, for working really hard, which some of those things are cultural to Australia, some are not. But if you ask them to do something that is psychologically uncomfortable, they will run from it so quickly it's not even funny. Mm. And I don't seem to, I'm working on it as much as I can through some of these discussions, but. Do you see that and do you have some ideas around how you can kind of take people along for that psychological mm-hmm. discomfort? Because you, you mentioned it early. No matter who you are, no matter what level you're at, you are going to experience negative uh, outcomes as part of your, say, s- sporting career. You're going to have injuries or well, the high probability you're going to have injuries. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have poor performances. You're going to have illness. You're going to have family things or, you know, uh, exams or whatever that you, is going to have detrimental effect on your performance. And you've actually got to be quite comfortable with accepting those yeah, probabilities. Yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you're uh, what we're talking about here is the same point I was saying before about going deep. Mm. So, yes, on the surface, I vomited, I went, you know, I sweated, I breathed hard, whatever. But when you say, you know, you are only going to get, to national level or you know forget about the olympic dream Mm. you're a national level athlete you know that's a tough moment to accept and that might be i'm saying it's just a genetic limit you cannot go beyond that and that's really hard for some people to accept accept that and so you then have to go well actually how do i measure whether i am good at this or not And, and you have to look at other aspects of what is athletic conditioning all about what is the joy of movement, you know, that feeling of of, uh, of a thrill of illinks is what Roger Kalwa okay. uh, called it. You know, the the feeling of just, it, it, um, you know, it, it's hard to give a word to it, but that feeling almost like falling mm. and falling into um, this kind of oxygen debt. I'm falling into acidosis. I'm, I'm falling into, um, you know, extreme fatigue. <laughs> and And to somehow kind of see the benefit of that and and often you know the hard thing to sell with athletes like you said is the rest part is how i'll bounce back from that you know like you know yeah we're going to have five minutes rest now between these reps tell that to a soccer player Mm. and you know they just don't know what to do themselves so yeah culturally we've got a big big battle you know to try and back up an argument like that a five minute fix your hair time you You might struggle with that man (laughs) that's right (laughs) But one of my first uh, trainers as a coach, uh, level two ATFCA, he uh, he said, "Yeah, give him a mirror." 
that you know they'll, they'll occupy themselves <laughs> you know, that, give them a phone but yeah selling like it's a culture change you mm. know so just to come back to the question we still haven't answered is yeah what are the benefits of coming into this you know with an artistic practice is that you're good at doing kind of chameleon like changes but also this sense of even your dramaturgical way you know that that sense of what is this doing for the bigger picture and always encouraging the athlete to zoom out and look at their long-term development so with my group at Coburg for example you know they all came to me around 13 14 that kind of age and I said well we're looking at Brisbane 2032 Mm. you know that's when you're that age you'll be at the peak of your physical development and so it doesn't matter if you don't win Little Ass 200 meter hurdles this week. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny though because yeah. people, I don't think people are very good at looking in long time scales, no. especially when you're younger. And I know I wasn't yeah. because you, you're impatient and you you have much less understanding of what time scales mm-hmm. even feel like. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you're all you know you're older than Jack and I, but I don't feel any older than what I did when I was 25, even though I recognise heavily my behaviors are very different and how I think about the world is different, but I don't physically feel any different. Um, and so it's this weird concept of you, you don't know what timescales even feel like, or you almost don't have the concept. And it's, it's, it, uh, for anyone who hasn't maybe thought of this, it's like actually think about what you are going to be experiencing when you're 80 years old. Mm, yeah. You know, when you, when you go and think about it, you're like, what will I be like? Mm. Will I feel like me or will I feel like a completely yeah. different person? You don't know what that is yeah. like. And I think young people yeah. with the lack of time, they actually don't know what that feels like. So you say to them 2032 and they're saying, well, that means absolutely nothing, <laughs> even though what you're saying yeah. is yeah. so correct yeah. Yeah. and it's so fair in terms of their overall development. I think the thing is just taking them away from that kind of pressure cooker yes. accountability that, that, that little ass culture is. Um, so well, yeah, that's a dangerous you know, part, little ass. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my group became quite sort of molded quite quickly into a crossover sort of thing. It's not open athletic carriers. They're not going to do every single round of cross country, mm. and and it's not purely little ass. They're not going to do every single week chasing that PB with their parents screaming at them. We're in this kind of crossover zone where you know the focus is not about times and races, but it's about general conditioning about developing their personalities so that they are robust and resilient. How do, you, how do you think that that will eventually be reflected in their performance? I, I think I'm going to come out with uh, a, a community of incredible people, who some of whom will pursue elite athletics, others will not, but they'll stay active and involved. Mm. And so, it, 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 Do you think that that has to be, you know, obviously that's something that you're very aware of. Mm. Right, cause some people don't care about. They're like, I'm just here to help yeah. this person get yeah, yeah. a result. Whereas it's clear that you want to help them develop yeah. as people. Yeah. Well, what do you think is the benefit of that? And is this is going to sound interesting, but is that a selfish pursuit on your part because it's enjoyable for you to be involved in that? I'd say it's a selfless pursuit in that I'm interested in building social capital and community. I'm not chasing my elite. I'm because I, I could have dropped. 18 of them already and just gone with the two that are, you know, sort of have the most genetic potential and the right kind of mindset. So well, I don't want to do that. I want to that's what I'm saying. Is it know. selfish that you're doing what you want to do? <laughs> well, if, if the athlete feels like, you know, and th- this is where, you know, my approach might be a hindrance. You ask, like, is it, is it, uh, it what are the positives? I said culture building. But it's also inventiveness, responsiveness, developing kind of performance-like focus, um, you know, curiosity, humility, engendering those good things. But if you think the hindrance is where you've got the gun athlete who is just on this kind of pathway, pathway yeah, and you can, they're sort of seeing you, you know, attend to an athlete who can't even run, you yeah. know, who's just come Trying back to teach from, them skills, yeah, yeah, scoliosis surgery last week, and and they seem really keen on athletics. And so I don't want to neglect that person because no. I'm all about developing a group. But when I get my specialists, like I've got one young triathlete, for example, I'll do other work with them and say it's still important you come to the general session, the community building and also your general conditioning. And we'll do little bits of specific work. But really, you've got to the point now where we're going to work outside of this as well. 
And that's a hell of a commitment, you know. And if I feel like I can't give them the time, I'll refer them, you know, like I asked you about long jump yeah, and triple yeah. jump. That's often one pathway that I go, yeah, you need to go there. And I know that Tom is looking for athletes and I'm always thinking, okay, if, I, if I've got a sprinter that is just doesn't need, um, you know, inventiveness, doesn't need culture, is just so driven, uh, like an Arban Dani, for example, you know, they've got to go to a specialist coach pretty urgently. Mm. Um, and I've got no problem with that. And, and I would see, and Jeff Risley as well, I would readily um, refer a distance athlete that I felt they're just on that path. They don't need my kind of skill set. And I'm really good with that. You know, like I, I believe in the ecology of well, our sport. I was going to say, I think people too often overlook the value of physical pursuits for, develop, for just personal development. Mm. And that seems to be something that you're really pushing here as mm. well one of the things that you're particularly interested in of what we actually gain as individuals by having the discipline of working at something, persevering, particularly because the reality is most people you're going to work with are not going to be elite or professional athletes. You're not doing it for that, so to speak. Well, you, you may be, but that's usually going to be the exception unless you've reached a stage where you're getting professional athletes coming to you to seek your services. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we, it's my own story. You know, like I, I was an elite junior in West Wales training on tarmac roads in what we called daps, you know, which were sort of crap <laughs> shoes of some sort, which had a sort of sporty logo. But compared really, <laughs> to nowadays, it's like a pair of slip on Uggs or something, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, I was driven and committed and, you know, but there came a point where life just took over. But yeah, I missed it so much. You know, mental health wise, uh, I could feel this kind of gap in my realm of experience that I craved, you know, and I was lucky that I'd had enough of it as a youth to to remember it, you know, but there were 13 odd years there where I, I missed it, I craved it, you know, and I, I want to sort of, especially when I work with fellow masters, I, you know, just remind them like, this is for life, you mm. know, we, we're doing this, you know, you might not be... It was, running 60 seconds at 60 years old, but you might be running 80 seconds at 80 and then you will be the world champion. Yeah. You know? Just stick with it. It's great. You know, the, it's so good. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, yeah. because I think it, it's an interesting crossover in terms of what you said, you know, there's a reason why you do pursuit and you set up your training environment the way you do. And I think that that to me reminds me a lot of the creative pursuits. And I, I don't know if you uh, read Rick Rubin's book on, creativity uh i don't know that one no. and do you know no. you know rick rubin the music producer uh i think i've heard you mention him but i don't know him uh, i'd be interested to, to to hear it, it has some uh, quite a like a spiritual slant to it but one of the things that he talks about yeah. um quite significantly is that his belief strongly with you know especially the top artists he's ever worked with is that you should never ever create art for the audience oh yeah yeah he yeah. think you know he's mentality is that the greatest art is always art that you create as an expression of your own experience or whatever that may be yeah and then you don't own once you put it out into the world you don't own it anymore it's now for the audience to decide what they want to do with yeah. that and you shouldn't necessarily in any way uh, be concerned with how they interpret it because it's not for you to decide that you know you shouldn't be looking at it and making go oh, i want them to interpret it this way and I think about this a little bit in terms of coaching because there has been a shift towards, and I, I you know, you spoke about Golden Path. I, I sit on this fence and I sometimes sit on one side and sometimes I'm on the other of do you really individualize down to that person or do you say, no, I'm making the environment that I can make that I know speaks to me and is in my skill set? And if that fits you, great. But if it doesn't fit you, then I don't, I'm not upset, but I, I just can't, I can't set up something that's based around you because that doesn't fit within what I'm capable of even producing. And, and to me, it's that very interesting balance that I'm sure you play with every day in terms of commerciality of creative pursuits versus something that's really an expression of your skill set. Yeah. That if you do that, I think in some ways, 
it often creates such amazing art or performances that the recognition will come even though you were not trying to create any commercial value to what you were doing. Yeah. I think I mean, this came up with the Massimo chat as well. Yes, like, yeah. You know, he's running a business. He's got to sell that jacket, you know, which actually you have to say is quite a nice jacket. <laughs> <laughs> see, if you, see if you can get a discount code for it. <laughs> yeah, well, I thought oh, that's reasonable. I, after your talk, I thought, oh, God, I bet these jackets are really expensive. But, you know, no, they're, not, thought, they're, not, they're not ridiculously yeah. expensive. But, yeah, you, you, you know, he's obviously found a bit of a sweet spot there with, you know, classiness versus usability, affordability, etc. But yeah, if I if I make a piece of work and audiences leave, I'm not going to be performing that work much longer. But I, the, how how do you actually on that? How do you actually deal with that when? Yeah, I'm sure there's actually probably even say friends or colleagues or people that you really think are strong judges of this who you think can be objective, and they say like that's actually some of your best work, David. But the audience goes, nah. We're out of here. Yeah. Well, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I've had situations like that. Um, I remember particularly one one strong moment in Edinburgh where I was playing in this room in the assembly rooms called the Edinburgh Suite, and they had a fire exit out to the street, um, Rose Street, and um, the an entire row just shuffled along, pushed open the fire exit to the street, and left. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I was in character at the time. I said, um, uh, "Good, that's got rid of them." <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, managed to just wait long enough that I got the audience on my side because they're obviously dying to see what's he going to do. Is this going to crush him, or you know, is he going <laughs> to find a way to come back from the dead? And then, having got that amazing laugh and response, you know, then I sort of went out the fire exit myself and shouted after them any chance of a lift to Peckham, <laughs> <laughs> which of course is not in Edinburgh at all, but I was just feeling like I was on a vibe, you know, like, yeah. and, and that, you know, and I've had other occasions where John and I actually the same show because that had the most sort of license to do that kind of thing and was also the most out there piece that did tend to push the boundary. Yeah. yeah make people leave. Um, you know, there was a time where I think we were in Manchester Met University and playing a, a theatre there. And again, there was a fire exit to a sports ground. It's a sports science place. And um, uh, we ran out of the building and we were out on the playing field doing stuff for about five minutes. <laughs> and the audience were all still inside going, what are they doing? I can't believe it. You know, like, could they see you? Uh, yeah, they could hear us. They could see us kind of occasionally. running around. Yeah. They're laughing. They just didn't know. You know, it's so edgy that, that for somebody just to leave the room. <laughs> and so, yeah, there, I mean, there are examples where you, you push the boundary, you try something, you sense, are they with me? Are they with me? And and this is a really key skill, you know, for us as coaches. It's like I'm sensing, I'm reading that person. And this is where, you know, I'm hoping that my psychology is going to come together with my performing art stuff, with my coaching, and I'll be able to read the person so well, you know, like uh, Dan Paff talked about this, you know, screening them just in wicket run. You can tell what's going on in their life just by the way you, you've got the standard exercise. You go, oh, yeah, what's going on? <laughs> you know, something's happening. Do, I'm sensing, you know. Have you ever heard of performers coming up with an idea that actually fails to begin with, but they go, I actually need to continue with this and persevere because I know ultimately the audience will align with what I'm mm -hmm. trying to believe create. All the time. Because yeah. I think in that, like even in yeah. like a performance or rehab setting where there's clearly people out there with some great ideas and some great innovation, but the masses may not be willing to hear it yet or take it on board because it's such a contrast to their current belief system. There's so much evidence of this, I think, in art in general, where you, mm. all these artists that died poor. Yes. And then, mm. Like Van Gogh, for yeah, instance. Oh, yeah, 100 years later, their art's being sold for millions yeah, and yeah. millions of dollars. And, you, you, yeah. and it's the same with, you know, it happens with books. It happens with, um, it, it obviously, it happens with, you know, paintings and things like that. But I think it even happens a lot with movies where people at the time, no one liked it. And then it becomes this cult classic. Mm. They're like, oh, yeah, this is from the 70s. And everyone thought this was stupid at the time. And then everyone's going, oh, yeah, you better watch this film. Mm. It's, it's a yeah. real piece they're, of history. They're now um, attending special screenings dressed in the costumes of the main characters. Well, I, yeah. I, from what I got told, that, that's what happened with Pulp Fiction, for instance. Mm. At the time, it wasn't actually that well received. It didn't win any awards. 
um, it came out in the same year as like Forrest Gump and all of this. So it got mm. smashed and everyone's just like, oh, this is a weird film by this, you know, Tarantino bloke who's done it's Reservoir pretty Dogs. Wacky, yeah. And now everyone's like, oh, if you haven't seen Pulp Fiction, you've missed out on, you know, more. People talking about Samuel Jackson should have got an award for best um, you know, supporting, supporting actor, actor and all the yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I love that film. I love it. It's, it's, it's a fan great film. <laughs> the Watch is Watch. <laughs> There's just so many lines in it. You know, um, a Royale with cheese. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Beautiful playing with structure. You know, like. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Did I just <laughs> did I just break your concentration? <laughs> but that that kind of like that was innovative at the time. But at the same time, he was just sort of plundering pulp fiction. Like yeah. Ted, you know, he was just a. a well, it, it's actually a good example because he yeah. seems to be someone who's always been like, "This is what I want to do," yeah. and yeah. I, if you don't like it, I don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, it takes a certain amount of uh, schutz bar, you know, to courage. Let's say mm-hmm. to keep the faith. And, you know, faith is coming back to comedy. It's absolutely critical that you believe what you're doing is funny. And, you know, then you get an audience who believe that what you're doing is funny. And then newcomers who are thinking, what is this? You know, like, I don't get it. And then they see 100 people laughing. They go, oh, it's quite funny. (laughs) And then they're in there. The question I have for you, particularly in the coaching setting, is where do you lean on this? Do you think that it's about attracting the people that are open to going on that journey? Or do you think it's about having the skill set to bring people along. Because whilst I think you can do both, I think it's probably energy wasted. Yeah. Well, I'm the second. Uh, I, I take all comers, uh, you know, uh, the, the requirements I say to people who approach me about whether their child can do training with me, which is the usual thing. I say, well, are they ready for structured training? You know, mm-hmm. is, have we gone beyond playing, playing, you know, mm-hmm. the, the uh, sort of Which, yeah, the first first you know yeah, that, involving people yeah in that. and i did a little bit of that coaching and you know like i had my athletes pretending to be kangaroos and then you know i was the guy with the gun hunting them <laughs> a block practice you know i'd say do you do you hear me rustling on your marks do you hear the click of the gun set <laughs> Bang! You know, and then they, would they run. run. <laughs> but they're all like this and bouncing, you know. <laughs> but it was working on their their, their um their, their reaction at least. And some plyometric. Um but yeah, look I I've I quickly realized that I, I want to go with a bit more structure, who, yeah. the pathway. I wanna see I wanna offer this elite pathway, um and but also lines of retreat and culture building, you know. And and really, yeah, uh I, I'll take anyone who's express that initial impulse for structured training um and yeah as you know like i will also at the same time i'm trying to develop myself as a coach um so i'm on this mentorship with altis and how are you finding that well i found it uh, i i really felt like i should have done my sports science degree before i started but you know i've done so much of my own research yeah. that i kind of felt like i could get away with it like i could perform the the role, right, the the role knowledge, as a yeah. very knowledgeable coach but i at my at times i had <laughs> serious imposter syndrome you know because you've got people like co-mentors especially working with the all blacks or you know the very high level um coaches but it was actually the guy from the all blacks peter hughes who's you know in sort of mentoring me as a co-mentor along with dan and Stu. He said, um, you know, I was looking at your bio. Why don't you do a project about performance? You know, because all blacks are using uh, performance now. And the guy who initiated that, and they were all now learning musical instruments, apparently. Hmm. Uh, you know, you can imagine. Yeah. Gnarly. Big 120 kilo <laughs> props. <laughs> Playing <laughs> your jazz flute. <laughs> and he said, you know, they're looking at that as a way of kind of in attunement you know that as a team they're sort of thinking about how they but also you know for all the other benefits of it i hope they keep the doing that we'll keep, we might actually have a chance of beating them <laughs> i don't know john <laughs> what these, uh, the these days the all brax orchestra um <laughs> so he told me as well he'd come from ireland he used to work in Derry, where i was based there for six years so we kind of had lots in common and he was talking about how uh the person who initiated that kind of creative strand with uh, All Blacks is now applying uh, Irish rugby. And, you know, those are the two kind of most like incredible uh, culturally sort of driven, and maybe Wales should be in there as well, really. But they're, 
the Irish rugby are working with a theatre company called Druid Theatre Company from Galway about you know, the sort of skill set that a theatre director is bringing in. Anyway, so he said, why don't you make your project about that? So I looked at the literature and, you know, I found very, very, very little written about this, this area. There's Brett Bartholomew's book, Conscious Coaching, which talks a little bit about this kind of relationship building, a bit about comedy. But it feels very kind of dated to me, even though it's from 2015. You know, he's talking about demeaning yourself as a sort of way of making people laugh. Hmm. And you're kind of going, okay, well, that's one theory of comedy. <laughs> Um, an adaptation of superiority, but it's not not the full picture. So, with their encouragement, I've gone more deeply into this. Um, and there was an actor in uh, the UK who got a bronze medal at London 2012. His name is Fuzz. Um, well, nicknamed Fuzz, everybody called him Fuzz. And he was an actor who trained at RADA, which is the drama school in uh, England. And he was bringing a character to his coaching, which was like this hardcore bully. You know, and he said, well, it's just a performance. But, you know, he got out of his group a bronze medal at London 2012. Yeah, with Robbie Grabaz, yeah. Yeah, which, of course, was like yeah, but every, everything. It was you've excused. heard what happens more recently. Yeah, he's been banned. Yeah. And, and it's for bullying, for all the things that he was proudly saying he was doing, maybe apart from the sort of... Um, we may not have time, but one of the stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know. we may not have time, but one of the things that I am really struggling with at the moment mm-hmm. is the fact that, I think sometimes the time scales, whilst, as you said, there might be 2032, mm. it's not actually a long period of time when mm. you think about someone's development. And I always play these games where I'm trying to push people's psychological development. And I get it wrong often where I, I push them a little bit too quickly. But often it's also to see where they land on it. And I think one of the things that we're getting really wrong at the moment, I think, in this safe space idea is that we are too far away from the line and that'll sound very controversial but if you don't work in high performance sport you may not know what i mean but essentially like the realities of and it's sport so it's not life but the realities of sport are that it can be very jarring and it can be very um uh, it, it can be very difficult to deal with situations of injury or performance, especially when it, at the highest level it's, there's money involved, there's opportunities involved, there's livelihood, all of these things. If you cannot deal with those things changing rapidly under your feet, then you actually don't have the skill set to deal with being in that environment. And part of, I think as a coach, and I think this is what you're doing well from a young age, is trying to bring people the understanding of like you need these skills if you don't have them you're actually underprepared to go to that 2032 thing and one of the things that i've been talking a fair bit with some of the bis stuff is like we're not doing a hell of a lot a hell of a lot of psychological development of expanding people's capabilities we talk about ideas like resilience but i don't know that we're pushing people to even develop it we're sort of saying well we'll give them a couple of little tools mm. But to me, that's, you know, like they're going to get thrown in the deep end. And it's not by you, it's by the sport itself. You know, you have a major injury and you're out for six months or you need surgery. in general too. And you kind of need to have exposed people to those things. And we're scared to do that because it's almost seen as you're pushing them too hard Mm -hmm. and you're challenging them psychologically or Mm -hmm. what you did was a form of abuse. And it's like, well. Well, and the reality is when you, push someone out of their comfort zone, it's going to evoke negative emotions yeah. in them. And for some people, they're not ready for that. And they actually, you know, as a protective mechanism, they blame you. Yes. And that's a, that's that's a, a natural a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's why, you know, Dan's experience with Marion Jones ended up with coaches writing contracts, you know. Mm. Um, mm. But, yeah, I, like I, I, I think, you know, I want to take my athletes to forest in the dark and make them run mm. blindly into a tree. Know, the trees, you know. <laughs> but, well, there's a gap. I'll say look, there's a gap between these two. If you look up at the sky, you can see the stars, you know, but <laughs> God knows what that is. How about we for it? You know? <laughs> and then, you know, you combine that with cold water immersion. You know, like I had a camp with my group down at Aries Inlet, and, um, you know, we were doing sort of run up to the lighthouse, which was way beyond some of the, the their kind of tolerance levels normally. but I said, and after this, we'll be jumping in at Butler's Bend there into the Pencallock Creek. Which yeah, is it's cold water, water, yeah. Freezing cold water. 
but you'll all be doing it. And I've got the floaty belts and there's nice fluffy towels and a hot meal coming after. So that those kind of lines of retreat, you know, um, I don't really mean of them as, as that. I, they're more like adjuncts. So, you know, like when you see Peter Ball in a gravity running treadmill or, you know, um, somebody, you know, any kind of form of deep water running or therapeutic running where you can, like I've got my spark trainer now, I've got my lip to go. I know that I can take a risk with that sprint training because I'm not going to lose six weeks. Because mm. even if my Achilles is absolutely in, on fire, you've got other things. I've, you got, can I've got other backup plans. So if I know about those, I'll take that risk in the reps. And, you know, food, a social structure that around it, and you think about this in psychology, the thing that works, if you remember that, if you've heard of the dodo bird effect, it's that everything works. But the therapeutic alliance, in other words, your coach athlete relationship, and the network of support around the client, the person, you know, at the center of the athlete, let's say, those things contribute more than whatever you do with. Them. Yeah. You know, but obviously you've got to do something, you know, which you believe in and it is as well researched as you possibly can make it. So yeah, running naked in the forest, in the trees, in the dark, you know, could well be the pathway to I think, I think let's end it on that. That's the perfect segue to finish <laughs> running naked in the trees in the forest. There's a, there's a really good book called The Comfort Crisis by, I think his name is Michael Easter, um, who teaches at Las Vegas University, I think. It is. And in, he interviews a lot of different people in the book. And one of the guys he interviews says that every, I can't remember, it's maybe like every three, four, six months, he sets himself a challenge that is, so difficult that he thinks there's, there's at least a 50% chance that he'll fail doing it. Mm. Let's talk about this. You know, we spoke about and, the flow stuff recently. It's saying you should set targets that it's about a 40% failure mm. opportunity. If it's too easy, it's not enough of a challenge. And if it's too hard, you're not going to do it. So it actually yeah. becomes demotivating yeah. as well. No, for sure. And like the reason why I just I mentioned that is I just think about the importance of actually trying to push, do something that you may very well fail. And even if you do, how you then navigate through that psychological state. Mm. It's basically a, the existence of a clown. The cl of a clown. A clown, exactly that. Mm. If you don't aspire to do something beyond your skill set, you're not going to get laughs because <laughs> <laughs> you're not going <laughs> to fail and we're not going to see you bounce back. Can you, actually, can you, I, I know that you're short for time, but can you describe that? Because I've never really thought about no. the... the behavior of a clown and what that actually yeah. represents and the actually the role and importance yeah. of that too well so i mean my training was with philippe gaulier in paris he's one of the few clown schools in the world um apart from uh, his colleague pierre bilon who runs a sort of one week annual event in switzerland and then jack lecoq the late jack lecoq where uh, gaulier used to train uh, to teach so my stuff comes from that i just to acknowledge that uh, that that's the world but he talks about mr flop so if you don't invite mr flop into your world you're not going to get the the spirit of the clown hmm. so the clown he, he would always set an impossible task okay so two clowns get on stage and you're now going to do um midsummer night's dream uh you know but there's the rest of the cast are on a bus to another city in another <laughs> country by mistake and so now you're going to have to do it um, and at some point when you sense you've failed, you're going to have to call Mr. Flop. <laughs> and there is like a, a, you know, an old buzzard phone on the wall. And, um, you know, you, you would, you'd sort of go, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, he would always give you a character as well. So like my one's a, mine was a, um, uh, French foreign legionary. And uh, so I had all my sort of gear, you know, and a big rucksack and a big pair of boots and a handkerchief off the back of my hat. And, um, and uh, you know, the first time I come on, I'm clumping, clumping, clumping like this. He goes, stop, bam, bam. And he's, he'll stop you until you get off. You're boring. He says, you're too noisy, too horrible. You're horrible. Get off the stage <laughs> like this. And there'd be 30 students, some of whom were just too terrified to go up and take that criticism mm -hmm. but then you'd also have a german guy i later worked with who would just keep getting up he'd say get off the stage you're boring okay two more clowns and this time we're going to do blah 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 and he'd, he'd get up back, and, and you'd go oh, come on you know just absorb what he's told you you're too heavy on your feet or whatever 
take a breath and then come back. But he wouldn't. He would just come relentlessly back. So I, I feel like those learning experiences for me were like heavy boots, phone Mr. Flop, and, um, you know, acknowledge that you're failing and then look for help. You know, like, how can I? And it's that spirit that audience laugh. Not so much. It's not mockery. But they kind of enjoy you struggling. But mm. they also as much enjoy your aspiration. And that aspiration and certainly the rebound moment when you failed and you bounce back with this, it's joyous, you know, and it's a different kind of laughter and it's it's philosophical, you know, that you've found the seed of optimism, if you like. So yes, you can train optimism, you can train to be a clown. Some people find it a lot easier, but you know, and they have a kind of bandwidth of tolerance for what some students think of as abuse but my bandwidth was huge because my drama school training i had a psychopathic bully just saying you know get that's, off stage. that's another discussion C word. yeah have you, but, have you seen the movie whiplash yeah yeah i love that film yeah it's one of my well, favorite that, films that was ever. my drama teacher exactly that. i think mm. about this concept a lot of like you know how much does creativity require you being mm. pushed to the mm. depths of your understanding and what that means, because I even think about this, you know, I'm not a parent and uh, I don't know whether I will be a parent, but I always think about the difference of as a parent, is your job to create the most high functioning human you can who contributes to society at the highest level, or is it to have, you know, a healthy, you know, happy yeah. person? Yeah. Because they're not necessarily always the no, same thing. No, and awesome. should you push your kids or is that abuse? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I, I'm not a fan of the, the bullying approach. I've been directed by people who still follow that tradition, you know, uh, both uh, post-studentship. I mean, you, you wouldn't get away with it in the education environment. No. And, and really, you know, any time as a parent, you seen your parents. question that i have for you is even though it's clear that they're it's not healthy on lots of levels do you think that in some cases it actually is the approach that works for particular individuals yeah, yeah. because that's the thing that i found interesting i actually you know i always push people to watch that film and i always want to know what they think and mm. weirdly these days everyone goes oh that, you just wouldn't do that that's wrong and my opinion is it's wrong for 99.9% .9 of people, but that's the whole point of what, you know, the, he, the mentality of, and whether it's right or wrong, that music teacher's idea is, he's not looking for 99% of people. He's looking for the 0.001% yeah. person who turns into, you know, one of the greatest musicians of all time. And that's his point. I'm not looking for and what's the person. I think what's the intention there too, yeah. you know, which is another thing to consider because unfortunately, most people will criticize you based on your actions, even if it aligns with good intentions. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't have to look far to see coaches who are doing it. And often it seems to me a kind of lazy approach. You go, you get 20 people sign up for your program and you, you bully them, let's say, with 10 200s. You know, and there's maybe like a one person know, who pops out every couple of years. Yeah. yeah. Somebody who can tolerate it. They survive and they've got rid of 19 of them. Happy days. They only have to look after one athlete. Well, the, the yeah. question that you always have, and I think this is the hard part, is if that person goes on to say, you know, be an Olympic finalist, mm -hmm. were they going to get there anyway? Or is that the methodology that was actually most appropriate for them? And I, I, results to me speak much more than the approach, yeah. right? Like you said, and I agree with you, it doesn't really matter what you do sometimes. It's just, it, well, it just needs to work for that individual. Yeah. Um, and sometimes what you think will work is not necessarily what does work. And you have to be open to the idea that the methodology that gets them there may be very, very uh, different to what most people would actually mm -hmm. benefit from. Well, Fuzz, that's an example. You know, you go, wow, okay. He got that guy from 88th to bronze medal, mm -hmm. you know, ranked 88th to ranked in the top 10 and winning the bronze medal. So performing on the day as well as, you know, sustaining a, a level of quality. But, yeah, at that moment it worked in that culture leading up to 2012. But post that maybe he didn't get his next, you know, potential person who was ranked 88th to get up there. And then he's exposed, his meth is exposed. And mm -hmm. we're going, well, really should you be? shouting and bullying no no I, I don't think that necessarily works i, I the, the, the mm. caveat that i always put on it is always 
if you're in those roles, in high performance roles, at the end of the day, your job is to get results. It's not to necessarily be friends with everyone and for it to be, you know, this super fun environment because you're not dealing with uh, the general community where it should be about, as you said, building something of value. You're actually there to get a result, which I think these days people are really scared of because it requires you to question sometimes the way in which you approach it and do things that sometimes maybe, you know, morally or ethically you know, questionable. questionable he, yeah. He's now in Saudi. Um, yeah. And he's been recruited by the director of UK Athletics High Performance at the, from that time who's recruiting other people. And he's also recruited Jessica Ennis, his former coach, who's yes. also currently bad. Mm. So they're all working in Saudi with, you know, a different kind of culture where it's permanently looking just for results. Mm. You know, um, but, yeah, personally... I'm not going that way. Um, no, no. And I, I, no. This, just the fact that so, like, so people understand, it's not mm. to say that in any way necessarily even advocate for it, but I mm. think you need to ask the question, why did it work in that environment? Mm. Are there aspects that I can take from that that may actually enhance what I'm doing if I'm in such an environment? Yeah. You know, and as you said, it doesn't work to just bully people all the time. Mm. That, that's the worst approach you can probably I, take. I think, you know, the, just... The, the um that encultured kind of let me say atmosphere of violence or bullying uh, I experienced at drama school and then latterly got invited to direct a show and um uh, it was after about six or seven years or so of practicing out in the world and then I came back and the that culture of uh, of bullying was so strong that students were actually complaining to me that I wasn't bullying them enough. <laughs> you know, to get the performance <laughs> out of them. <laughs> so, you know, they just were... You Wanting, know, I, yeah, abuse they, almost. They, that they needed abuse to, you know, of course that could have easily flipped back. I mean, it might, it, it might be just two or three voices that were asking for it, but then it, you can't really create bespoke bullying for one person <laughs> without affecting the whole group. So I, I had to reject that. And, but I, I remember thinking deeply about it at the time that I, I just... I just feel like they are so deeply now in Stockholm syndrome here that it's the only way is to keep that culture's perpetuating yeah. itself. I mean, it's all gone now. One student ended up build, burning down the building. You know, <laughs> that's how much anger it generated and terror. But yeah, it, it, for some people, responding to terror works. Others, you know, they're just going to get stressed out and burnt mm -hmm. out. And I don't think it's really sustainable long term. No, I don't think it's sustainable yeah. practice. And that's yeah. the problem that you face. I the only, I've thought about this concept a lot and it's probably a time for another discussion, but of, I don't know that you can create a level of turmoil and chaos, but if that exists in that environment, irrespective of the players in it, say for instance, it's, you know, a low socioeconomic or there's a criminal background or it's just a very difficult family situation sometimes that stress in itself emotionally psychologically drives a level of capability and resilience and skill set development and i've thought a lot about can you create that i don't know that you can because the only way to do it is what we're talking about making people's lives extremely difficult and when they see that you're volitionally doing that it negates any of the benefit that may come out of it. But you see it over and over again in sport, in art, music, of these people who come from really horrible experiences. You know, the number of people you see, say, for instance, America is a good example. If you look at the representation, particularly of African-American athletes, by and large, they come from quite difficult backgrounds. Yep. You know, low socioeconomics, drugs, you know, the family's been involved in crime and things. Like, and it is their opportunity mm. out that pushes them to develop these skills. Yep. I don't know that you can actually foster that at well, a volitional level. I, I, I know what you're talking about that research because I, I came across it where they, were, they studied all these sort of elite achievers and everybody had some kind of crisis in their development at some point and that they got through. Um, but I think, you know, if you think about Stu, we were talking about Stu McMillan and Dan Paff and the way they kind of dramaturgically organize a training session. 
and that it sort of starts in this kind of softer way, but then it zones into this moment where the real the sort of high peak work is done. And I think you can, if you sort of aware of your performance as a coach and you sort of, you know, train yourself to hold space in different ways, that you can get that moment where, you know, they kind of get the violent trigger that they need to do the high performance. But then there's the line of retreat after the safe space to kind of go, yes, it's safe enough for us to go violent here. And then I'll give you a protein shake later and we'll just debrief, you know. I mean, that's the point I'm at now with my kids because I've got socioeconomic disadvantage, you know, through the group, not not totally, but, you know, there's parts of it. And I'm looking for sponsors for, you know, somebody to buy me a like crates of up and go so I can give them that nourishing post racing so they know I'll go there. And if nothing else, I'll get get my job. You know, so, yeah, I, I think it's possible, but with a masterful person who's, aware of you know infecting performance and that, and that's really what i'll be doing with my mentorship the, th- the final kind of project is me talking about how can we train those skills um you know you know a coach who's knowledgeable or whatever but just to be aware of the performance and be in control of the performance that way you know the opportunities are endless and any client is possible to work with full so, stop david <laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to join us it's uh, been it's a fantastic a discussion and yeah. as you uh, you did allude to this it probably could go for about five hours so yeah i know we'll probably <laughs> we'll probably get you back on at some stage if you're happy yeah. to do that with us yeah maybe post the mentorship would be a good time yeah that'd be great you know after i've done the when is that it finished for you we we finished presentations in june and then we get invited to atlanta for a you know the yeah. apprentice coach program Perfect, yeah. so you know six months time or so mm-hmm. i'll be fantastic david yeah thank, thank you. you dr david woods thank you thank you